Last time I presented the basic outlines of Plato's and Aristotle's systems of philosophy, and I came out strongly in favor of Aristotle. But whose philosophy did the ancients come to favor, and why? That is our subject for today. In order to understand whose philosophy the ancients came to favor, we need to take a look at the historic context in which Plato and Aristotle found themselves. At the time of Socrates' death, in 400 BC, the Athenians had just suffered through almost 30 years of unimaginable turmoil and destruction. The Peloponnesian War was an unprecedented conflict of Greeks against Greeks, with Athens and Sparta as the main antagonists, and the remaining city-states on the side of one or the other. While all of the Greek city-states had been fighting many wars against each other in the past, these wars had mostly been restricted to local rivalries between neighboring city-states. The purpose of these wars was rarely to conquer or subjugate the opponent, but served as a way of settling territorial disputes, or forcing the other side to making certain concessions. Consequently, these wars were highly ritualized, and the number of casualties was quite low. However, the Peloponnesian War was completely different. Let me give you a few numbers to indicate the level of destruction that went on. During the first part of the war, a Spartan invasion of Attica forced the rural population around Athens to seek refuge behind the fortifications of the city. This tightly packed crowd of some 300,000 men, women and children was cut in half by an outbreak of the plague. Can you imagine what it would be like if you lived in New York City today while some four million New Yorkers started dying all around you of some unknown disease. During the second part of the war, the Athenians were bereft of stable political leadership. Military decisions were increasingly subjected to the changing moods of popular opinion within the Democratic Assembly. At one point, the assembly ordered a military expedition be sent to Sicily, an island that few Athenians would have been able to find on a map. In total, this expedition force consisted of some roughly 200 triremes and 1,500 soldiers, more than half of the fighting men Athens had left at this stage, and they were entirely wiped out. Imagine if today, one million American fighting men were sent to some remote place overseas without a single one coming back home. Now these are just two of the major lowlights of this conflict, the carnage of which affected all of Greece and included the wiping out of entire Greek city-states at the hands of other Greeks. And what was it all for? All this destruction, which ended the Athenian Golden Age, what did it accomplish? Nothing. Not even the victorious Spartans derived any benefits from it. The final result of the conflict was merely to set up a new balance of power within the Greek world, so that the slaughtering could continue in the not too distant future. During the lives of Plato and Aristotle, the Greeks continued this policy of exhausting each other until they were ripe for the barbarian takeover. And so in the end, 30,000 Macedonians achieved what half a million Persians could not. Over the course of three centuries, while operating on an average per capita income of less than $3 a day, this extraordinary culture of just a few million men had discovered philosophy, science, history, literature, drama, higher mathematics, physics, biology, and so much more. 
yet their inability to discover and establish the right political structure to maintain this unsurpassed lust for life, thought and action would result in a self-inflicted wound from which they would never recover. The Greeks had suffered great calamities before, especially at the hands of the Persians. And yet they emerged stronger from these conflicts, because they knew their cause was just. But this time they had done it to themselves. It was not large-scale death and destruction in the righteous cause of self-defense, but in the cause of senseless self-immolation. The resulting decline of the Greeks' self-confidence in their own values and culture could be felt in the immediate aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. Not only because they used great men like Socrates as scapegoats for the disasters they had brought upon themselves, but in many other, more subtle ways. Slowly but steadily, they started to abandon self-fulfillment in favor of self-indulgence. They gave up on doing any new thinking in favor of habit and routine. They gave up happiness in favor of momentary pleasure. They no longer tried to solve problems, but to avoid and postpone them. They stopped innovating and started imitating. They gave up achievement in favor of escapism. They stopped having children. They gave up self-determination and liberty in favor of a quiet life and following orders. They lost the excitement of waking up in the morning and felt relief at the prospect of falling asleep at night. Instead of resisting the barbarian invader, they started to welcome him. They withdrew from this world in favor of another or as an end in itself. They gave up on life in hope of salvation. Now think, what kind of philosophy would be more compatible with such an ongoing cultural decline? Who would people find more appealing, Plato or Aristotle? I'd say under such conditions, Aristotle doesn't stand a chance. If people start to turn away from life on earth and want to find some sort of salvation instead, then Aristotle has nothing to offer them. Indeed, this new environment of cultural decline provided a fresh breeding ground for every school of Greek thought, except Aristotle's. Atomism was picked up by Epicurus, whose philosophy boiled down to the following ethical advice. Don't value anything too strongly. So long as you don't have any strong values, then you won't get hurt in case you lose or don't achieve them. Do not venture, and that will be your salvation. Heraclitus and the Sophists were picked up by later skeptics, like Pyrrho. And they advised, Don't try to understand the world. Knowledge is impossible anyway. You'll feel much more at ease once you no longer try to make sense of things. Stop thinking, and that will be your salvation. Pythagoras, Parmenides and Plato were first picked up by the Stoics and later by the Neoplatonists. The Stoics' advice came down to Emotions are the enemy. If you don't feel anything, then nothing can hurt you. So abandon your emotions, and that will be your salvation. The Neoplatonists said Stop being so concerned about yourself. You're just not that important. Try to stand outside yourself. Leave your petty worldly concerns behind 
and merge your soul with a higher principle of eternal truth and infinite goodness. Stop being selfish and that will be your salvation. But what is left to man's life on earth once he has abandoned his values, his mind, his emotions and his self? Well, the answer is obvious. Since salvation was the only reward these philosophies had to offer, they suddenly found themselves not only competing with each other, but also with every form of conventional mysticism that existed throughout the ancient world. The stage on which this competition took place had expanded as well. It was no longer limited to Greece. First it expanded to Egypt and Persia, following the conquests of Alexander, and after Greece was subjugated by Rome, ancient philosophy's final act would play out in the growing Roman Empire. And just a few words on this last. While the Greeks were busy exhausting each other in the 4th century BC, the Romans had achieved a more stable political order and hegemony in Italy. This Roman Republic had a number of admirable qualities. Unfortunately, after the First Punic War, the Romans stopped integrating newly conquered territories into their republican political structure. Instead, they turned to large-scale subjugation and enslavement of foreign peoples. This seed of empire would quickly grow and eventually leave no room for anything else. And so gradually, the Republic degenerated into the interest group warfare of democracy and then into open civil warfare. What the Romans did to each other in the first century BC, following the breakdown of their political order, makes the Peloponnesian War look like a picnic in many ways. But the psychological effects were the same. The Romans, too, started to lose self-confidence. They turned more and more mystical in hope of some sort of salvation. The more educated ones among them had long been exposed to Greek philosophy and were particularly attracted to Stoicism and later to the Neoplatonists. But what about the uneducated masses, the slaves, and the ever-growing number of welfare recipients throughout the empire. They also wanted salvation from this unintelligible world of anarchy and civil strife. But Greek philosophy, in its explicit form, was a little too academic for them. They were looking for something more palatable. And so to fill this gap, a whole new galaxy of mystery cults emerged which included not only the traditional pagan mystery cults, such as the Dionysians or the Orphics, but also new imports of Eastern mysticism, such as Mithraism, Judaism, the cult of Isis, the Manichaeans, Zoroastrianism, and even shades of Hinduism and Buddhism. While spreading throughout the empire, all these religions and mystery cults kept splitting up into countless sects and subsects at an unbelievable rate. And the reason for this is obvious. As men are turning away from life on earth and lose their confidence in reason to deal with reality, they become deprived of any objective point of reference to refer to in order to determine what is true or false. And so any claim made by one of these different mystery cults becomes as good as any other. All you can do is decide by your feelings which one you like best. And if there's some particular doctrine you don't like, you can just form a new sect with a slightly different interpretation. By the time that Saint Paul began to popularize the new cult of Jesus in the first century AD, he was merely forming one new sect among many different sects within Judaism. There were also the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, 
the Alkazites, and so on. Many cult leaders of this time, including Jesus, were convinced that the end of the world was imminent. The popularity of this idea came as a result of the previous century of chaos and destruction brought about by the political unrest within the empire. Paul's idea of worshipping Jesus as the Son of God was also inspired by the cultural atmosphere of this time. Similar claims had already been made about all sorts of different religious and political leaders, most notably the deification and worship of the Emperor Augustus. As time went on, the cult of Jesus became more and more successful in outcompeting the other mystery cults for new followers. Unlike other Jewish sects, the cult of Jesus did not require you to be a member of the Jewish tribe or any particular tribe in order to join. Nor did you have to pay costly membership fees or be a respected citizen. Anyone could join, including women and slaves. There was only one addendum. Once you join the cult of Jesus, you cannot be a member of any other cult. Something which other cults allowed for those members who wanted to hedge their bets. Many Christian names for the devil, like Baal, Lucifer or Beelzebub, originate from this period because they represented the deities of Christianity's early competitors. In spite of their great success in finding new followers, the early Christians faced the same problem of continuous disintegration into smaller sects, as did all the other mystery cults. Among those who worshipped Jesus were the Simonians, the Ophites, the Sethians, the Cainites, the Marcionists, the Montanists, and many others. These sects all disagreed with each other about questions of technical mysticism within the Christian framework. For example, how do you define the nature of Christ or the Trinity? What holy days do you observe? What Christian writings should or should not be accepted as the true word of God? And so on. So a whole new realm of academic subjects emerged for Christian scholars to invent, study and based on their given position to excommunicate each other. These subjects and positions included things like Gnosticism, Valentinianism, Monophysitism, Diophysitism, Miaphysitism, Docetism, Nestorianism, Monothelitism, Sabellianism, Arianism, Semi-Arianism, Anti-Arianism, and on and on it goes. Now all of this represents complete conceptual overload and disintegration. And it is an unavoidable consequence if you base your epistemology on the primacy of consciousness and a free study of platonic forms. Once the real world of the senses is no longer in the picture, you can just make it up as you go along and create the most bizarre intellectual problems and controversies. But if you think such conceptual disintegration is an exclusive phenomenon of religious scholasticism, then you don't know the glass house we're living in in the 21st century. Just like the ancients, our modern philosophers have abandoned reason and reality, and they have done so for the past 200 years. That's why in today's universities, you'll get the opportunity to study subjects such as structuralism, functionalism, structural functionalism, functional structuralism, structural realism, neo-functionalism, interactionism, intersectionality, positivism, logical positivism, legal positivism, anti-positivism, post-positivism, and so on. Only instead of discussing how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, our modern scholastics will teach you to discuss how many types of genders can fit into women's bathrooms. Although that isn't really fair to the religious scholastics. They at least believed they would be rewarded with salvation and eternal bliss 
by solving these platonic puzzles. The moderns don't even believe that. Their practice of conceptual disintegration has become an end in itself. But let's get back to the early Christians, for whom there is significantly more excuse. In order to rein in on the ongoing conceptual disintegration and sectarianism within their own ranks, it became clear that any free thought in the interpretation of Christianity had to be suppressed. And so the early Christian bishops started to have regular meetings in order to vote on a uniform Christian doctrine. Once a majority was reached on any given issue, the matter was forever closed and all remaining voices of dissent were branded as heretical. As part of this process, the New Testament was slowly put together over the centuries. And it was also decided to keep the Old Testament of traditional Judaism as part of the Christian canon. These developments of early Christianity serve as an eloquent illustration of why mysticism always leads to dictatorship. Once reality and the evidence of the senses are rejected as the arbiter of truth, then force and coercion will rush in to take their place. For the same reason, our modern scholastics are turning more and more against freedom of speech. As the centuries went on, the Roman Empire continued its ongoing decline. Transitions from one emperor to the next were commonly accompanied by a few years of anarchy and civil war in order to determine the next succession. Here I would like to give you a few more numbers to indicate what cultural decline looks like. During the first century BC, the Romans fought dozens of civil wars involving hundreds of skirmishes and battles. One of these battles was the Battle of Philippi, in which some 200,000 troops were fighting on either side, making up a total Roman fighting force of 400,000 men. 400 years later, the Roman Emperor Valens failed to fend off a Germanic invasion of the empire and died on the battlefield while commanding an army of 20,000 men. And that will give you an indication of how some savage Germanic tribes were able to succeed where Hannibal and the Carthaginians had failed. The ongoing chaos in the later Roman Empire provided a perfect breeding ground for Christianity, which was the most consistent in preaching worldly resignation and supernatural salvation. In the beginning of the 3rd century AD, Christianity had succeeded in gaining political power. At the end of that same century, Christianity was declared the official church of the empire and all other religions were no longer tolerated. In 393, the, the Olympic Games were prohibited and in 529, the last schools of Greek philosophy in Athens were closed. The Dark Ages had arrived. In conclusion, let me leave you with a few movie recommendations that I found helpful in concretizing some of these events. Now, unfortunately, I don't know of a single historical drama depicting the Athenian Golden Age, the Peloponnesian War, the life of Socrates, of Plato, or of Aristotle. I mean, we have dozens of movies and television series on Henry VIII and hundreds on Nazi Germany. But the 150 years between the Greco-Persian Wars and Alexander the Great are a complete void. Something which I find absolutely baffling. So my first recommendation is the 1960 movie Spartacus, which is a great movie in and of itself but it will also give you some idea of Roman political turmoil in the first century BC. Coincidentally, it's also the only good movie directed by Stanley Kubrick because he had nothing to do with the table of content. My next recommendation is the HBO series Rome, 
which unfortunately was only picked up for two seasons. It covers the events from Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon in 49 BC up to the triumph of Augustus in 31 BC. The reason I love this show is because it does a fantastic job in depicting a completely different kind of culture. A culture with strong elements of Platonism and Sophism to be sure, but at least one not yet prostrated by 2000 years of full-blown Christianity. Citizens, be aware that the vassal, Prince Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, has come to the city. By order of the Triumvirate, during his residence here, all mockery of Jews and their one God shall be kept to an appropriate minimum. The show also does a great job in illustrating the transition within Roman culture from the educated, stoical traditionalist, as represented by the character Lucius Verinus, to the uneducated, whim-worshipping brute, as represented by Titus Pullo. For storytelling purposes, the show includes a number of historical inaccuracies, but they are mostly minor. The only real criticism I have is the depiction of Cicero as a fragile and timid character. Like all HBO shows of this kind, Rome includes a lot of sex and violence, so it is not for everyone. Still, I highly recommend it, and it is available on Netflix in many countries. Another awesome TV show is I, Claudius which is based on the famous work of Robert Graves and got produced by the BBC in 1976. It starts with the reign of Augustus and ends with the succession of Nero. So to keep the order of events straight, I suggest watching Rome first and then I Claudius. The show is highly entertaining and educational, but what I love most about I Claudius are the brilliant performances by many famous Shakespearean actors, including Brian Blessed, Sheehan Phillips, John Hurt, Patrick Stewart, and above all, Derek Jacoby. Should you decide to watch I, Claudius, please don't be turned off by the pilot episode. It may seem a little weird at first, not only because it is such a different kind of production from, from what we are used to in modern television, but also because the actors are a bit stiff in the beginning, as they are still trying to find their roles. But if you stay with it, I'm sure you won't regret it. The show also has some nudity and violence. Interestingly, the violence depicted in the show is done without the usual sound effects which I found made it much more effective and horrifying. And my last recommendation is the 2009 movie Agora. It's not a great movie, but it will give you an idea of the choice the ancients were faced with in the 4th century AD. On the one side, there is Hypatia, a typical Neoplatonist who has a passion for the pursuit of knowledge as an end in itself, and in turn has contempt for the body, sex, romance, and worldly things in general. On the other side, there is the Christian mob, who wants to enforce religious uniformity by taking over the government and destroying the last remnants of paganism. Our sympathies are with Hypatia, of course, but the pagans of this era really were their own worst enemies. Next time we will take a look at the most important philosopher and champion of the Dark Ages. A man whose ideas would define man's life on earth for a thousand years. And then we will turn to the philosopher who would finally bring back the light of reason into this barren medieval world. So until then, thank you for your kind attention.